Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's lovely to look out and see a full house. See this guy back here? Most of you recognize him. The cowardly lion from The Wizard of Oz. I think Peggy Taylor's the only person I know that doesn't, has never watched The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> the, wizard, the cowardly lion is a great big scaredy cat, and I love this guy. Because I really feel that anything worth doing must make you a little bit frightened, a little bit afraid. And I really believe that it's the daily small acts of courage that dominate most of our lives. It's not the grand and biblical acts of courage, it's these little acts of courage. So that's what I want to talk about today. I'm a psychiatrist, and I've been a psychiatrist for 22 years. I work in the greater Seattle area looking after the chronically and severely mentally ill, and I have done for a few years. I lived in England about five years ago, and for two years, I didn't work with any regularity. So when I returned to this country, I was dying to get back to work. I really wanted to work again, and I took the first job that came along. And it was this job. I didn't want to work with the chronically mentally ill, and I particularly didn't want to work with the worst of the worst. Those non-responsive to medications, the petty criminals, the drug addicts, the prostitutes, and the homeless. I wanted to work in psychotherapy with people like you and me. <laughs> I did, honestly. People who could articulate their problems. I could say a couple of clever things, maybe make a few helpful suggestions, and we'd all feel great. <laughs> really great. And that wasn't the job I got. I got this job. So I went along to my first day of work. And I went to my first team meeting, and it was terrible. They argued with each other. They interrupted each other. They fought with each other, and there was a lot of swearing. And I just come from England. <laughs> this was not the healing job I wanted for myself. This was it. This is my team. This is my team. These people are some of the most dedicated people I've ever met. They roll up their sleeves, they get down dirty, they go out into the streets of the greater Seattle area, and they work with these people. They work in the jails, they work in the group homes, they work in the cleaner, clean and sober homes, which incidentally are teeming with drugs. They work in the hospitals, and they look after these people. They care for these people. They laugh with them, they cry with them, they love them, and perhaps most importantly, they tell them the truth. They perform acts of courage and compassion that you can't believe. And so I want to tell you a couple of stories about them. I'm going to change up the names and the locations and the identity just to protect those involved. And I'm going to start with a story about Louise. Louise works on our team. And a couple years ago, I was getting back from a vacation. OK, this particular vacation, I had gone on a 10-day silent retreat. And I can tell you, if you want to torture yourself, don't work with the chronically mentally ill. Go on a 10-day silent retreat, because <laughs> that's torture. <laughs> that's real torture, but that's the topic for another talk, not this one. So I got back from the silent retreat. And I, when I got back, I got word that one of our patients had died under very sad circumstances. I immediately called Louise, and she told me the circumstances of the death. And when deaths like this happen in mental health, often the implication is that the team or the treatment team is somehow, uh, in, somehow didn't do their job properly and is perhaps responsible. So our well-meaning management, <coughs> misguided perhaps, had issued instructions about how they wanted our team to deal with it. And this involved like a designated point person. And this did not go over very well with our team. We work really closely together, which is why we fight a lot. Uh, we're more like a family than a group of professionals, really. So it's that kind of fighting. And we wanted to be close to our family. And um, 
I said to Luis, can I have the telephone number? I'm calling the family immediately, whether or not I'm on that designated list. And she said, I'm so happy to hear that, because to tell you the truth, I went to the family on the weekend. I spent the afternoon with them. I brought them a bouquet of flowers and a card. And I said to her, that was the right thing to do. And she said, I know that was the right thing to do. My heart told me what to do, and I had to do it. I called this family, and they were devastated, understandably. They felt guilty. They felt like they hadn't done enough. They felt like they would have done things differently. I knew the type of pain and suffering that a family like this goes through because my own grandmother, years and years ago, had lost her adult son under very similar, uncannily similar circumstances. And she was heartbroken, and she died three weeks after him. And I think it was of a broken heart. This family was suffering. Mother Teresa says, we are not called to be successful, but faithful. We hadn't been successful with this family. We had not been able to take away the dreadful and imaginable, unimaginable symptoms that this woman was suffering. They were some of the worst symptoms that I had seen in my 22 years of being a psychiatrist. <clears throat> when I was with the family, I asked the family, could we, as a, a treatment team, could we come to the memorial service? And they welcomed us. At the memorial service, they read Louise's card. It was the most compassionate and beautiful thing I had ever heard. It expressed to the family how she had known their daughter. And it meant so much to that family. While they were reading it, Louise was sat next to me. And she turned to me. Her eyes were wide. Her face was red. This is a very humble person. She couldn't believe they would read her card. And then they asked, was she in the audience? And could she get up and speak? Well, I don't think this is a woman that ever imagined herself speaking in front of 100 people. But she got up, and she talked about their child. That meant so much to the family. And Louise was able to do that because the heart called her to do that. So of course she would do that. Now, this is the kind of act of courage that's so beautiful and so moving. I'll often go to Louise on the team, because so many situations come up that you can't even really believe. Like, for example, we have one person that likes to call 911 quite a bit. <laughs> this person was actually in the emergency room calling 911. <laughs> <laughs> like, so it, it's quite confusing to know what to do day to day, but I can always go to Louise when I'm confused about what we're going to do about something. Because with Louise, you can count on where her perspective comes from. It comes from the heart. Thomas Merton, an American Anglo writer, Catholic, mystic person, says, said he had an epiphany one day on the corner of Walnut and Sixth Street in Lexington, Kentucky. And I had my epiphany on a downtown Seattle street corner this one day when we had a fire drill. And we'd all been called out onto the streets. And there I was on the streets with this motley crew of patients, clients, staff. Couldn't tell any of us apart, to be honest. <laughs> and I looked around. And I was, like he said, overwhelmed with this realization that I loved these people. I was theirs, and they were mine. What does that mean? Pima Chodron says, it's something about breaking down the walls between us. It's something about being willing to see ourselves in kinship with each other, while at the same time imagining lives that are very, very different from our own. I'll often say to the team, 
No, we're not a harmonious symphony around here. We're more like a discordant jazz band. <laughs> we still fight and argue. And if we have people coming and visiting us, like maybe new staff, because we always need new staff, if we have new staff or someone visiting, I'll say, for gosh sakes, don't be yourself. <laughs> Let's behave ourselves today, OK? We have a team member, our roller derby diva, as we all like to call her, because she's into roller derby, whatever that is. I've got to go out and look at it sometime. And she says to me about every week, she says, are you leaving? <laughs> not this week, I'm not leaving. Like, if I do anything out of the ordinary, like take that picture of them, she said, is that a goodbye picture? <laughs> and I said, she can't believe I would stay. And in fact, none of us believe that the rest of us would stay. None of us believe it. And if any of us disappear for a dental appointment or a doctor appointment, we're all whispering in the hallway saying, they've gone on a job interview. <laughs> They're leaving. Because why would we stay? Well, I can tell you why I stay. I stay because I get to feel my compassionate heart. I stay because I like to work with the most challenging patients. I stay because I get the opportunity to relieve a small bit of human suffering. And that's important. And I stay because I'm humbled by people living with mental illness and the courage it takes to go out into their life every day and these incredible people that choose to care for them. And when I work with them, I'm humbled and that makes me feel alive and like I belong somewhere. That's why I stay. So people will say to me, how do you find balance when working with people where you have to give so much to go such a short distance? Well, I can tell you how I find balance. I work with Young Women Empowered. Young Women Empowered is a leadership program that a handful of us started about three years ago. And we, we serve girls between the ages of 12 and 18, a diverse group of girls. Many of our girls are immigrant girls, and we have a handful of Whitby Island girls as well. My own daughter, Charlotte, Christina Parker's daughter, Sarah, Alina Frank's daughter. These are a couple of speakers you'll hear later today. They are daughters as well. And I would like to tell you about Amina. Amina, she's my hero. Isn't she beautiful? She's my hero. Amina is a 19-year-old Muslim woman who came to this country from Kenya and Somalia when she was 15 years of age. She came all alone without any family. She was 15 years of age. And she joined YWE and worked with us for two years till she went off to college. She learned to speak English. She got straight A's in school and ended up on the honor roll. And she landed a full scholarship for Pacific Lutheran University, when she was, where she's now attending. And this is what she said about Why We. She said, my favorite part of Why We is the, the support they offer girls like me. I taught them how to cook food from my country, Kenya, my home country. Everyone in my community, all 46 girls, liked the food and were proud of me. That moment was the time I found my strength and began to give all my heart to my community. For the first time, I felt that I was equal to other people in this society and important to the world. Everyone deserves someone who believes in them and helps them find themselves. Amina. This was a tiny act of courage, cooking sweet potatoes. And yet, it was an act that transformed her view of herself and sent her a long way into her life. So what I know is that all humans thrive with a little love and attention. Whether you're someone with a mental illness walking the streets of an urban environment, or you're a young woman weathering the vicissitudes of teenage life. These small acts of courage we can give each other make a difference in our lives. And for me, at the end of the day, that's all that really matters. 
Thank you.